So these are some of the things I'd like to accomplish. I'd like to give you a general overview of deaf culture, okay? And I would like to demonstrate some of the challenges in providing care for this population. And you'll hopefully start to see some of the similarities bef between providing care for the deaf community, the culturally deaf community, and some of our underrepresented minority populations as well. We're going to come up with or display some strategies to overcome some of these barriers. And the last thing is going to be some audience participation in a very low stress, sort of low key kind of way. I don't have any financial disclosures. And at this point, I would like everybody to take out their cell phone or tablet or computer, because we're going to do some poll everywhere. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this or not. But if you can, either type into their web browser this website, or for the majority of the questions that we go through, you can actually text the word URMC residency to the number 37607. If you need some help, I can come around and help you get logged into this. And the first question should pop up because it is activated. So just let me know if it doesn't show up. Are you guys doing OK? See a couple nods. Anybody having problems? All right. So here we go. So the pieces of paper that you have, you need a blue and a yellow. So I want you guys to partner up. And this is going to be a lip reading activity. So what I want you to do is turn to your partner without any sound and mouth the words. Read the sentence or the question that you have and see if your partner gets it. See how many words they get. So this should be a totally silent activity. And you can do it as fast or as slow as you want to. So we'll give you a couple seconds to do it. Yellow to blue, yes. I always hear a lot of laughter during this part. It's supposed to be a silent activity. love watching this activity. It'll be 30 more seconds. <laughs> okay, so it seems like everybody's probably about finished. So I'm curious, did anybody in the audience get 100% of it? No. Nobody. That's, that's usually the case. Did anybody get about half of it? So maybe we have one person who got about half. So, so I want you guys to think about how you felt during this activity. Just keep that in the back of your mind, because we're going to talk about this a little bit later, OK? Think about some of the challenges of that. So everyone's got their phones ready. Let's do a little bit of some questioning. It looks like some people answered already. So into your phones, type or text. When you're about to see a patient who uses a different language than you do, what goes through your mind? And I will tell you, when I do this with my residents, I have a moderation feature on here because they put all sorts of creative answers up. But you guys, your answers are going to come right up. So I need an interpreter. This is going to take a while. I hope Marty is, <laughs> works today. The interpreter phone number, dial the interpreter phone. What else? A lot of times, where's the blue phone comes up here. Do I have access to a person or video interpreter? Good, these are really good. Another one that comes up often is, I'm going to be in the room a while. I need to let another attending know where I'm going to be. What is the Marty cart? M-A-A-R-T-I. What is that? Yeah. Video interpreter cart? OK. Who has the interpreter phone? Great, all right. So here's some testing of your interpreter translation service knowledge. So by law, 
ASL interpreters and their associated costs are the responsibility of the physician or the clinic? True or false? Good, you guys are doing a really good job. The majority of the um, audiences that I present to usually get this correct. This is true. This is part of the American with Disabilities Act. So it is a national uh, law and mandate that we have to provide the services for our patients who do not speak English. And this is great and it's empowering for our patients. But I think that if you think about it, it may have some unintended negative consequences. Certainly in the smaller emergency departments or smaller clinics, where now all of a sudden the cost of interpreter services, translation services falls on that small clinic, which may not have the, the financial background to, to pay for it. And so that has consequences down the road with them thinking twice about accepting a patient who doesn't use English and requires an interpreter every time they come. So um, there's maybe some room for some political advocacy, advocacy here. All right, next question. So this is another free tech. So what do you think the best way to get a deaf patient's attention would be? You can free text in your answer. Good one. So there's a caveat to waving, right? You could be standing behind them and waving and that's probably not going to work. So you do have to be in their field of view, but waving is great. Like same thing with eye contact. So you have to make sure that you're actually in front of them or in their field of vision to make eye contact. And you certainly don't want to make it in this, you know, really awkward, like, get in their face type of way. What else? Writing is good. It's a good way to communicate, which we'll talk about in a little while. However, if you don't have the patient's attention yet, they don't know that you're there, writing may not be a way to get their attention. Great. Get in their line of sight. Tap on the bed, so that's a good one. I would, I would um, caution you to be gentle when you're doing that because a deaf person is gonna be very sensitive to vibration and motion. So you certainly don't wanna be aggressive when you're tapping on the bed, but certainly something like this is absolutely acceptable. Tapping on the table when you're with a deaf, culturally deaf patient, good. Eye contact, waving, all right, good. I would say that the best way to do it would be getting in their line of sight or from their side placing your hand on their shoulder or giving them a, a gentle tap. And I think we're going to save this for now. So. so this slide is one of the most important in the talk. And this gives us an idea of which population that we're talking about. So I'm talking about this side of the chart. Okay, so when we think of a deaf patient or when you all think of a deaf patient, you may think of the hearing person with presbycusis who grew up hearing their entire life most likely identifies with an ethnicity or a race and sees their deafness as an illness, as a medical problem that needs to be fixed. And that's often the way that physicians see deafness, as something that went wrong that needs to be fixed. However, the culturally deaf population is a group of people who were born deaf or went deaf at an early age. And so their primary means of communication is gonna be American Sign Language and not English. And American Sign Language is its own language, with its own syntax and its own grammar, and there is not a universal American Sign Language. There are, there are different sign languages for different culture, countries. So Spanish Sign Language, British Sign Language, Italian Sign Language, those are all completely different. And this group of people, they, they view their deafness culturally. So this is something that is maybe passed down through families or passed down through their community. They want this, and this is the sign for for I want you to be the same as me. So this is not something that they think needs to be fixed or corrected. And that's a very big difference in comparison to how most physician think, physicians think of deafness. This is a slide that I put in here when I did this uh, presentation with one of my deaf colleagues. And she said, you know, your information in your presentation is really helpful, but it's kind of negative. It doesn't show any of the positive parts of the deaf community. And that was a really great point. Because deaf gain is this concept that deaf people contribute to the world. They contribute to society in ways to improve it. Can, you, can anyone in the audience think of a way or something that, that may have been discovered or, or invented by a deaf person? I usually hear crickets at this time. So there are more things than, than you can think, than you know, actually. So um, texting. Texting is actually uh, a way that 
deaf people communicate primarily and was invented not by a deaf person but for deaf people in um, I want to say like the early 1970s, okay? Closed captioning along those lines is another thing that was invented by deaf people. There was a big conference at Gallaudet University, which is in Washington, D.C., big conference in the 1970s that talked about the utility of captioning and sort of experimenting with it. Um, video phone messaging, so video emails, things like FaceTime, all that stuff was initially developed to have, um, to have direct communication for deaf people and has sort of gone, you know, uh, to our own hearing culture. So this is just a quick list of things that, that deaf people value. Certainly their eyes and their vision, um, their hands and their signs, some of the things that they helped develop, video messaging, video vibrating and alert systems. So for example, the doorbell rings in our house, the doorbell is connected to the lights that blink in a deaf person's house. Our alarm clocks ring, they have a pillow that vibrates to wake them up. Uh, those sorts of things. Certainly they value interpreters and they have these organizations, deaf clubs and, and advocacy organizations that help them as well. So what are the barriers to care for a deaf patient? And you can see in this very cheesy diagram, I've, di I've divided it into about four different categories, but the root of the problem is going to be communication and that affects and impacts each one of these. So let's see what we have. The first thing is going to be obvious, it's going to be language development barrier and the implications of that. So because most children, 90% of deaf children are born to hearing parents, they have delayed exposure to language for a variety of reasons. The, the parents don't know that the child is deaf, the parents don't want to accept that the child is deaf, they want the, the child to be in a hearing world. All of that leads to limited access to language and information, which leads to low English literacy skills and low English and low health literacy skills. And ultimately all of those things together are going to cause our patients or our, or our deaf person to be in a lower socioeconomic status. And I think that in this slide you can start to see some of the parallels between our patients who are just have low resources, <coughs> excuse me, and low access to, to education and thus lower um, English and health literacy skills. The next thing that I want to talk about is their, their social issues or, or sort of delayed social development. There's this concept in the deaf community called incidental learning. Incidental learning is something that takes place when you're not trying to learn something. So for example, you can be sitting at the dinner table and your parents are talking about how your grandmother had a heart attack and how she had two stents placed. In a hearing world, the hearing children are listening to that conversation, maybe not participating in it, but they've just learned that my grandma had a heart attack at the age of whatever, okay? In a deaf family, if, the, patient, if the, the parents are not signing, that information is lost to the deaf patient. And as a result, they don't pick up on things like family history and past medical history. Another example I'll give is I have a, a colleague who himself is a deaf pediatrician in Rochester, and he has a hearing brother, and fortunately for him, both of his parents signed. So there was a, a family of signing people. However, when there was an adult conversation, an adult conversation, so things about uh, money or balancing the checkbook, they stopped signing and they would, they would just use English. And so the brother who was hearing got access to all of this, I'm gonna divert this money to here to pay this, this is when I have to pay the bill, this is how I write a check, and my deaf colleague got none of that. And to this day, he is much worse at balancing his checkbook and finances than his brother. So th that's incidental learning, okay? And that's something that the deaf community is far behind on and often in their first year of college, especially at a deaf university, they will focus on things that should have been picked up by incidental learning. Limited exposure to social development, this is because they often don't have access to a community of peers who use the same language and have the same culture of them as them at a very young age and wind up having sort of delayed development there. And minimal access to community information, this really depends where you are. So in Rochester or maybe DC or California or other places with big deaf populations, this may not be as much of an issue, but I remember in one of my sign language classes seeing a commercial about a, a deaf boy who came downstairs, he was a school age kid, came downstairs, he's deaf, his parents are talking in the distance, it's totally silent, the TV's on, he gets on the bus, the kids are talking, he's at lunch, the kids are talking, he comes home from school and finally he's in front of the TV with closed captioning. And what he had missed the entire day is about a big earthquake when hundreds of people had died in a community around him. And so that's an example of lack of access to community information. So this, there's gonna be some familiarity and some similarities between the deaf cultural group and 
uh, any other underrepresented minority, I think, except for the first bullet here. The, the patient will come into the room and the deaf and the provider often has the tendency to focus on their deafness, even when it's totally unrelated. They're here for knee pain. Well, when did you go deaf? Why did you go deaf? Does your family history, do you have a family history of deafness? And they're thinking, why are we talking about my ears when I'm here for something completely unrelated? And maybe in a tiny percentage of time, they may be related if you're talking to a, a young child who has a congenital problem. But for the majority of the time, it's probably not. And this really creates some distrust and um, some angst when you have a deaf patient in front of you. Fear of inaccuracy, again, has to do with communication between the provider and the patient themselves. If they don't have adequate access to communication, um, that's certainly a problem. And then fearing, fear of appearing uneducated. The deaf nod, patients feel like if I ask a question, I might appear stupid. I don't know which information is important to even ask in this situation. Or I don't have the communication ability because I don't have a, an interpreter available in order to be able to ask my question in an educated way. So all of those things create sort of fear of the provider. And that fear exists in many of our underrepresented populations for some different reasons, but it does exist. And what, what winds up happening is these patients will seek services less and have less access to care. And then they have increased comorbidities. In some studies done in Rochester, where there are prospective studies, there is an increased risk of obesity or interpersonal or intimate partner violence and suicide in comparison to the, deaf, to the general population. And the last big topic that I want to talk about is provider misconception. So the first thing that I really want to emphasize is our hesitant, is our, uh, our often uh, common practice to rely on lip reading. And I will tell you that it is really something that should be avoided. And I think now, after you guys did that exercise, you could see how difficult it is to lip read the English language. And we'll talk about a couple of different things in a second about why. But Think about the terms and the words that were in those sentences. You guys are all fluent in medical English, right? So a deaf person who has low English literacy and low health literacy is probably not going to know any of those words, the medical terms. And so you pile that on to trying to lip read um, English in general, and it becomes nearly impossible for them to figure out what you're trying to say. And that leads to a lot of communication problems and inaccuracy. Inappropriate body language is another important one. So the deaf person is going to be very sensitive. They're a very visual population. And so your posture, where you're sitting, how you position yourself, your facial expressions or reactions or lack of reactions to what they're saying is also going to be important. So having an interpreter there to interpret your reactions is ideally the best way. But if you can somehow, now I don't want to say over-exaggerate, but demonstrate your empathy for the patient or that you are, in, you are a caring person by the way that you're standing or you're sitting on the bed with them. I think that that goes a long way for the deaf patient. Be careful with the use of written English. So if you have no other option, obviously you need to communicate some way with your patient. I would suggest using very simple and short questions. You know, pain, where, question mark. Those types of things are going to be easily understandable by any deaf patient. I will tell you that the national reading level for a deaf patient for English is about second to third grade because it is a second language for them in comparison to between fourth and sixth for the, for the general hearing population. So you do have to be careful with using written English, okay? Inappropriate habits while working with an interpreter, this is a huge one. So the interpreter is an incredible part of the healthcare team, but they are a, they are a conduit of information for you and for the patient. They are not a patient advocate. They are a cultural advocate, so they will let you know when there are some cultural nuances that maybe they're picking up, or if the patient isn't understanding necessarily the type of question you're asking. But they are there to convey information. They're there to do this, which means facilitate information. So d talk directly to your deaf patients. Okay? Don't address the interpreter. Don't say to the interpreter, can you tell him that his test results are normal and that he can go home. The patient's right there, so address them normally. <clears throat> and I think the last point is that 
it's okay to be uncomfortable with foreign languages and foreign culture. I think that we all naturally are because it's, it's sort of fear of the unknown. But you have to know that you're uncomfortable with it and then you have to take a step to make yourself a little bit more comfortable with it and learn a little bit about it, especially if you're in, a popula in an area where there is a high deaf population. All right, a couple more questions. So you can text or you can go to the website. So culturally deaf people view their deafness as a disability, an advantage over the hearing world, a unique and unifying characteristic <clears throat> to their community, or a medical diagnosis or problem. You guys are good. Let's see what we got. Nailed it. Nice, you guys are all paying attention. All right, this one you have to go through the website, through the web browser. This is my favorite, uh, this is my favorite one. So in this picture, I want you to actually, you're gonna just touch your screen on where you think the interpreter should sit or stand. See how we're doing. All right, there's a couple right answers. Someone thinks they should sit on the computer. It's unique. <laughs> a couple of my residents actually picked on the patient, which I think was funny, probably an, an, an accident. So good, you guys are doing great. So this, this is the area where you want the interpreter to be. Okay, the reason for that is because the patient can now see both you and the interpreter communicating at the same time. They can see your facial expressions and your body language, and they can see the interpreter conveying that information to you. If they are in this chair, or this chair, or on top of the computer, they really aren't gonna be able to see that, and they're gonna have to turn their head back and forth, and most likely information is gonna be lost. So this is why this is the most, the most um, appropriate seat for them. So, when working with an interpreter to care for a patient, I should directly acknowledge the interpreter during the patient interview. True or false? Interesting. I may need to change the wording of this question. So the answer to this question is false, okay? And what I mean is that who should I communicate directly with? Should I communicate with the interpreter or should I communicate with the, with the patient? All right, so you can acknowledge the interpreter and say hello, <laughs> but you shouldn't be communicating directly to them. So maybe I'll switch that question. Yes? So this is a great point, and it usually comes up at some point during the lecture. The communication preference needs to be established at the beginning of the encounter with any linguistic minority patient or any patient that you don't have language concordance with. Um, so that's a really great point. Because some deaf patients will want their family to interpret. Some patients will want to communicate by writing, or they'll want to communicate and struggle through lip reading. Um, depending on the nature of the information, I think that you can, you can al allow them to have their preference. But there are definitely gonna be situations where you know as a provider it's going to be unsafe or difficult for them to provide that information through someone who knows them very well. So I would just be careful about that, but that's a really great point. Establish that communication preference. All right. All right, so what Approximately what percentage of the English language can be lip read? And I think this is our last one. Can, can I ask a question about those? 
Of course. Um, is that across the board for all deaf people or for all? How widespread is the spread? I'm guessing that there are children who are simply not exposed to a lot of education, whether they're deaf or not, and perhaps it's a more acute issue for a deaf child. But like, I, will, I, mean, I don't ask people for educational level, and usually within a minute, I have a sense of where they are just from speaking. But I'm thinking back to all of the sentences I've written, and I'm like, oh my god. So that's a that's a really good it's a really good comment. It is a it is a very wide spectrum. That is merely the average. If you are in a place like Rochester or Washington D.C., the literacy level for English is going to be very very high in that community because they have advanced degree programs in those cities. If you live in a city like Rome, New York, or Schenectady, or something like that, who have residential schools, so K through 12, the literacy literacy level is going to be a little bit better. If you live in a place that has none of that the literacy level is going to be lower. So it, it depends on where you practice. And I think that I scared you guys with that first activity, because the answer to this is, is 30%. The majority of you have picked 15%. But I think it speaks to your point. It speaks to my point that it's very difficult. right? It, it's very difficult to understand lip-read English. And then you throw in medical terminology, and it's, it's really a challenge. OK, so to talk about lip reading and why it can be so difficult, right? So these are a couple of examples. This guy, there's no way you're going to understand what he's saying with a surgical mask on. You can imagine being in a procedure and trying to mouth something to a deaf patient, right? That would be terrifying. I put this person up there because he has, doesn't have a mask on, but you can barely see his lips. And you have no idea what sort of facial expression he's making. So that, that is another great example. This is Kirsty. She's one of my nurses um, at a community ED in Rochester, and she's British. So the words that she uses and the way that she says words is very different compared to the way that, we, that I do. So also very limiting. All right, you're going to get one more opportunity to try and guess what I'm saying. Let me start it over. And the first going to be in normal speed, and then it will be in half speed. There we go. Now half speed, half speed. Anybody? I've had two people get this very, very, very close. One is actually the program coordinator at U of R, and she doesn't have a medical degree at all. So it says, your chest x-ray shows pneumonia, and you need an antibiotic called azithromycin to help make you feel better. Right? And, and now you'll have to forgive me. I look super depressed or something in that video, but <laughs> I promise that I'm not. OK, so here's the time where you guys are going to watch a video, and you're going to throw out things about what I did well and what I did not do well. And in these videos, you will see myself as a physician. You will see my colleague, um, Dr. Rob Nutt, who's a deaf pediatrician. And you will see our other colleague, Elizabeth Butcher, who is our interpreter, OK? And this is where we'll talk about what to do and what not to do. So this one is going to be based on my behavior and my body language. Hello, I'm Dr. Rotoli. What can I do for you today? Should I, should I talk louder, or should I talk to you? Well, I'll be interpreting, so you can just kind of speak like you regularly would, okay. and I'll interpret what he says back to you. So what, what's wrong? Yeah. What should I look at? I'm not really sure. Should I, should I look at him? <laughs> so the photography is amateur, I do realize. But let's go back to the beginning. What, what, did, I, what did I do well? Yeah, good. So I said hello. I was a friendly face. I told him my name. Anything else? Yeah, but that's good. I asked for constructive criticism, right? Did I follow it? Not really. I didn't listen. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, no, what did I not do well? Good. The positioning is really is really bad, right? So I'm on the opposite side of the bed. So he's going back and forth like this, trying to figure out who's talking and, and you know what I'm trying to say. Someone else had a comment back there. I just wonder why you look <laughs> Right? I don't know. Did you see my face? I'm like, is he deaf? <laughs> right? A deaf person, even though that's ridiculous, a deaf person is going to be really sensitive to that. So keep that in mind. Don't make those faces. Didn't convey any information, right, was, and was probably offensive. Yeah, exactly. Good. All right, next one. This one's on lip reading, okay? Oh, question. Go ahead. Five minutes. Okay, we're, we're getting close. Hi, Mr. Mutt. I'm Dr. Rotoli. What can I do for you today? Oh, is he deaf? Okay. I'll just uh, slide it down a little bit. I'm, I'm Dr. Rotoli. What can I do for you today? You can, uh, you know, look at the interpreter and use the interpreter for our interaction. Do you read lips? Uh, you know, a little bit, but okay. really we can communicate through the interpreter directly. I think, I think if he probably understands me, we'll just, he could probably read my lips. <laughs> so I won't ask you what I did well on that one. What did I not do well? Right, so the patient gave me their communication preference and I didn't follow it. That's, that's the main point of this one. Anything else? Yeah, I, I yelled in this guy's ear who's deaf from a young age. This isn't deafness in an old age where he just can't hear high or low pitches, right? So really offensive, obviously very dramatized in this, but really offensive to the patient, so. How about the positioning? Yeah. <laughs> Right? Don't lay your hands on another human being, I would say is the point of that. But at least you're both on the same side of the bed, right? So that's a, that's a positive. All right, last video. Okay, so I have all of his test results. Um, can you just tell him that uh, his CAT scan and his labs are all normal? And he probably can just take uh, Tylenol or Motrin Q6 hours. <laughs> So I, I think this one's pretty obvious. You're all laughing, right? So I'm, I'm addressing the interpreter. Can you just tell him, please? And he's like, what the F? Just talk to me. I'm sitting right here. So this is a really good question, and I have asked this several times to several different interpreters, and I get, I get one common answer, and that is that they are there to facilitate information and to be cultural advocates. So if I'm doing something that is culturally inappropriate, they may give me a little nudge or tell me, you should probably stand over here, or they may say, address the patient, where's the best place for us to stand, you know, as to not put me on the spot. So they will do that. What they won't do is say, stop, this person doesn't understand what you're saying, or I don't know what that means. You know, they will do it in a different way without trying to break that role. And it's a very difficult line for them, and I, it's, it's a really gray area, but that is where their expertise is. In the back of the room, there's a question. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, recently, I had a deaf patient, and um, we had uh, software on uh, iPhone. Mm -hmm. So video remote interpreting, which is what you're talking about, VRI, is, a, is, is not very fondly looked upon in the deaf community. It was developed by hearing people and we thought, wow, this is a great solution. We have instant access to an interpreter. But it, it is really not a great solution because you, it's all of a sudden two-dimensional. 
The spacing is really difficult depending on the room size that you're in. The Wi-Fi connection and the ability for that video to transmit appropriately and at normal speed really, really is quite variable. Um, and so positioning specifically, I think you still position the interpreter at the foot of the bed. Um, and then the patient, you know, the patient is going to have to look back and forth. There's no other way to do it because you can't have a, unless you have an amazing camera that has a 360 or 180 view of the whole room, um, it's going to be a real challenge. And so, and that's one of the reasons why it's a real challenge. If you have nothing else, that's what you need to use, right? If you don't have access to 24-7 interpreters in your hospital, which is pretty rare, our hospital does, but it's pretty rare, then you have to use what you use. But know that the deaf community is not going to be happy with it. Okay, so last slide, some take home points. I really want you guys to recognize the difference between culturally deaf or uppercase deaf and lowercase deaf. And I want you to ask about communication preferences and then follow them once the patient gives them to you. Be careful about your working relationship with the interpreter and be careful when you're explaining things to patient and beware of that deaf nod, which is sort of this deer in the headlights, I don't actually know what you're talking about, but I'm gonna nod anyway. And that can actually just be called the nod, like we see that with all of our patients, right? And that goes along with describing and explaining disease processes and being really careful about what you're saying. Don't make assumptions about the patient's education level or communication level because it's going to be really variable. Um, and try and do a little bit of teach back to confirm what your patients know and what they don't know. And I think that's it. Thank you.